You may remember the first successful video we made, Dark Theories About King of the Hill. There are a lot of dark conspiracies about our favorite residents of Arlen, Texas, and today we're returning to our theory roots, channeling our inner Dale Gribble and digging into the best conspiracies and fan theories of King of the Hill. Why isn't my head wrapped in tin foil? But this time in a new format where we actually break down the validity of these theories and rank them from BS to truth bombs. That's right, like our good to evil format, we'll be breaking these theories down and ranking them by plausibility. From the BS and full of holes, to the possible, to the probable, and the absolute truth bombs. Let's get started. Are you attempting to know me? Now first up, let's get the theories out of the way that have been debunked. These theories have either so many holes that they can't possibly be true, they're completely lacking in evidence, or they've been confirmed false by creators. Simply put, these theories are bullsh**. Dale's right about everything. The X-Files. Okay, so although this theory is really far out there and kind of neglects much of what we see throughout King of the Hill, it is a bit of a fun one. Now, with all the crazy conspiracies that Dale spews out on an episodely basis, from government cover-ups to alien abductions to Cuba stealing his lawnmower, it's easy to let his theories go in one ear and out the other. But what if they were actually true? Like all of them. Joseph's real father is Nancy loves you. An alien. In fact, what if Dale knew all this because he encountered Agent Scully and Mulder from the X-Files? Well, many viewers have suggested that this may have been the case due to the connection between the two shows. King of the Hill and the X-Files did, after all, air back to back for a while on the same network. But let's look at the actual evidence. In The Simpsons Season 8 episode, Bart Starr, we see that several characters from King of the Hill make an appearance showing us that the two universes seem to be connected. And one season earlier, we also see that Agent Scully and Mulder also visit Springfield as well. Do you understand? Yes. Not to mention the existence of aliens within the Simpsons universe itself. So given the X-Files and King of the Hill share the same connected universe, could Dale be correct about all of his alien theories? Well, probably not. We're ranking this theory as fun, but ultimately BS for the simple fact that these types of references are usually just played off as one-time jokes, and actually linking the canon of these universes completely just because of a one-off gag is a huge stretch to say the least. I'll be in the safe room. Don't let them take you alive, dear. With all that said, we will say that occasionally Dale's conspiracies are true. Let's not forget Chuck Mangione did live in the megalo. Mark. Moving on, we have Hank Hill's father is Tom Anderson. If you're a longtime Mike Judge fan, then you know that Hank Hill gets a lot of influence from one of the characters from Mike Judge's earlier cartoon, Beavis and Butthead. That character is Tom Anderson, the elderly neighbor who is the constant victim of Beavis and Butthead's antics. Anderson seems to be an older version of Hank with a nearly identical voice and many of the same personality traits. You boys seen a golf ball come through here? Tom Anderson is also a World War II veteran, much like Hank's father in King of the Hill, Cotton. This theory suggests that Tom and Cotton served together in World War II. Tom Anderson was wounded, which resulted in him having PTSD and potentially poor eyesight. This is evidenced by the fact that he is shown to be easily startled by loud noises and is always fooled by Beavis and Butthead's disguises, despite how poor they are. Due to these issues, he was unable to care for his son and gave Hank away to be raised by his former army buddy, Cotton. You're never gonna be a war hero like me, you can shoot like that. So, there are some pretty massive holes in this theory. For one, nothing about Cotton's character in King of the Hill would ever suggest that he would be willing to adopt another man's kid to raise. But even if that were a possibility, Hank looks just like his mother. They are way too similar to not be biologically related. And furthermore, Hank's son Bobby looks just like his grandfather. There's no denying Tom Anderson was a huge influence on Hank's creation, but Cotton is definitely Hank's dad. 
and possibly the biggest hole in the argument, Tom Anderson cooks with butane. Arlen's real life location. There is a real obsession with finding fictional cartoon cities in real life, and Arlen, Texas is not safe from these speculations. Well, this theory comes from people who have pointed out an on-screen map. They've concluded that Arlen is in fact representative of Clifton, Texas, about three miles away from Austin. They point out the real town's river and state park, as well as a couple of other points of interest that are comparable to Arlen. Now, the creators of King of the Hill, including Mike Judge, have stated that Arlen was influenced by several Texas towns that he listed by name. This isn't to say that Clifton wasn't a small inspiration, but as the creators have pointed out, much of Texas as a whole played an influence. Even Bobby's school, Tom Landry, is a real middle school that looks pretty identical. We all like the idea of discovering the real Arlen, but its influence is confirmed to be spread out throughout the whole state by Mike Judge himself. Moving on from the BS, these theories still have a lot of problems. Not enough to say they're completely debunked, but still, these theories are full of holes. Hank Hill is in the closet. Are you gay? What? No, I sell propane. Yes, that's right. There are some theorists out there who believe that Hank Hill is in fact gay and hiding his orientation from the world and that the show is about Hank suppressing his homosexuality in middle America, specifically struggling to grow up with a hyper-masculine father like Cotton and a strict set of Christian beliefs. Some of you, like Hank, will be killed. Growing up by these rigid rules that were created for him, Hank developed a hatred for anything that might be considered flamboyant. And he is afraid or uncomfortable with anything like it because of his constant suppression of that side of himself. This theory presents a possible reason for why Hank is so uncomfortable with emotions, feelings, sex, or opening up in just about any way even to the extent that he tries to stop Bobby from embracing anything that he feels would be too flamboyant. No more dancing or any other Canadian tricks. Theorists behind this one suggest that Peggy's kind of mannish build, manly personality, and huge feet allowed Hank to marry her, and the two are almost never seen being affectionate or intimate with one another. The reason why this one is full of holes, however, is that although Hank is incredibly uncomfortable with with many of the things we mentioned, there isn't any evidence to suggest that he is actually gay. One of the constant themes of the show is Hank's over-the-top conservatism, not politically, but in that he is uncomfortable with just about anything outside of his norm. And with such a maniac like Cotton as a dad, his childhood really did a number on him. Just because Hank has big problems with expressing his feelings or vulnerability doesn't mean that he's hiding anything in terms of his sexual orientation. Much of this theory is speculative and there isn't really any evidence for it. And although Hank rarely shows intimacy, there are a couple examples in which he does with Peggy, like in the episode Strangeness in the Train. Up next is the theory on Dale's catchphrase. We all know Dale's catchphrase that he blurts out whenever things get serious. Shasha. No one's gonna catch the big D off guard. Shasha. But where the heck does this come from? Is it a random thing or does it have an origin? Well, in season six, it's revealed that Dale speaks fluent Russian and the term USA in Russian is three Russian letters. That actually makes the sound S, SH, and AH. When put together, they make, you guessed it, Shasha. Could Dale's catchphrase be a chant of USA? We're gonna go with no. The big hole being that we all know Dale's thoughts on the federal government. We doubt that Mr. Gribble's catchphrase is a patriotic cry. Up next, we have the ever popular theory of Boomhauer being an agent spying on Dale. Of all of Hank's friends on the show, Boomhauer has always been the biggest mystery. We don't really know what he does on a regular basis or even if he currently works. 
I mean, it's on the couch, you don't whimper and whine, and the next minute it'll be up and out. But the series finale revealed something about him for the first time. In the final scene, he walks out of the room and we see a Texas Ranger badge on the table. Which is a bit surprising, given the fact that Boomhauer seems to spend all of his time sunbathing and chasing ladies. Not to mention, his work never came up in conversations when his group of friends were talking or complaining about their jobs. Why wouldn't he ever bring up his career? This theory suggests that Boomhauer has to keep everything quiet because his work actually involves him being a spy. Which explains why he keeps a somewhat low-key lifestyle. But why would a spy need to be stationed in small town Arlen, Texas? There isn't really a whole lot going on, right? Well, this theory goes on to suggest that Boomhauer is specifically spying on Dale Gribble. We don't have to remind people that Dale's vocal opinions of the government are not exactly positive towards Uncle Sam. Guns don't kill people, the government does. And we also know that Dale has genuinely caused a lot of problems throughout the show that might go as far as to put him on some sort of watch list. He's been the president of a gun club, at least one local militia movement, has openly conspiratorial viewpoints, is clearly pretty mentally unstable to varying degrees, and has been in trouble with law enforcement for a number of small, be it trivial, offenses. He also traffics weapons, in fact when he was selling them out of Peggy's bookstore, he got incredibly worried when a cop showed up, which suggested he was doing so illegally. What I sell is a lifestyle. Did Boomhauer befriend Dale so that he could keep tabs on him for the government? Well, no, given the fact that they were friends since childhood. But could Boomhauer have taken on the job in order to watch over his friend and keep him out of trouble with the feds? It's really unlikely, but maybe? Another thing to note is Boomhauer's job was referenced in the past, and although it was only one time, a different thing, you know, head job. it may very well be that Boomhauer was injured on the job and is simply collecting disability. He could very well be using a phony badge as a way to meet women. With that said, we're now into the middle category, where we might actually stumble into some truth. Maybe. These theories are possible. It was quite a shock when Cotton died in the later seasons of the show, given the fact that he was one of the most outright hilarious characters. Back off! I didn't want you! I wanted a boy! But what if he actually faked his own death? That's what this theory suggests. First off, this would be a giant F you to his son Hank, and he could watch the misery from a distance afterwards. Which kinda sounds like Cotton. But this theory points at the possibility of Cotton faking his death so that he could go into hiding to escape being arrested for murder. In the episode Moving On Up, Cotton and his pal Topsy go visit their friend Pops, who turns out to be dead. And I'm arresting you for suspicion of murder! The two men get into a fight with Griffin and his roommates, and the scene gets cut off. Some fans have suggested that this fight resulted in the murder of some of these roommates, and that Cotton has worked to cover it up. When the feds get too close, Cotton is forced to fake his own death. This theory is a bit out there, sure, but we rank it in the possible category just in the hopes that if the show is rebooted, we get to see more of old Cotton. Cotton also has a narrow urethra. Everybody knows about Hank's narrow urethra. We'll get that out of the way. But what about his dad? Given the fact that Cotton constantly berates his son with the jab about his narrow uriri, as he calls it, is he overcompensating? If I wanted to see a big baby cry, I'd go home to my baby. Did Cotton pass the small urethra gene onto Hank? For one, Cotton claims that Hank got his narrow urethra from his mother's genes. But when Hank meets his long lost half brother in Japan, it's revealed that he suffers from the same problem. And they have different mothers and were both fathered by by Cotton. Now, on the flip side, Cotton does have three kids, so it's very likely that he doesn't have a narrow urethra himself. Not to mention the fact that Cotton has bragged about the hundreds of women he's been with, and given his personality, it wouldn't be unlikely that he has many other children he doesn't even know about. Plus, he had GH when he was an old man, which probably means that he doesn't struggle in that particular department. Alright, I'll call him GH. 
Good hat. But the reason why we're ranking this one as possible is because although Cotton likely doesn't suffer from this problem personally, because both Hank and Junichiro both suffer from it, it is likely a recessive gene that got passed down from their father. Next up we have a bit of a thematic theory. Bobby never goes through puberty because he never went deer hunting. This theory is a bit too speculative to believe outright, but it is very interesting and adds a really interesting layer to the show. Bobby, throughout the series, although mature in many ways, is still quite childish, and he never goes through puberty, keeping his raspy yet still high-pitched voice. This theory suggests that it's because he never completes his rite of passage with his father. He never hunts the deer. Everybody's got a deer and I don't. In the episode Good Hill Hunting, Bobby, Joseph, and Connie are supposed to go hunting with their dads. It's stated that Bobby and Joseph would leave as boys and return as men. Long story short, Hank never acquires the hunting permit, meaning they can't go. Bobby refuses to shoot the deer at the range because it's unethical and he and Hank leave empty handed. On the way home, Bobby hits a deer and they pass it off as Bobby's kill. And uh, it's a good clean kill. Yep. This theory suggests that because Bobby never successfully hunted a deer, he cannot truly become a man. Joseph and Connie eventually have episodes that center around them each going through puberty, but not Bobby. Could Bobby have failed the test that allowed him to become a man? That's what this theory suggests, and although it's very thematic more than anything else, there aren't really any holes in it. Speculative? Sure. We're certainly not saying it's true, but the subtext could definitely be intentional. Luann blew up the Megalomart. Luann may be an overall sweet character most of the time, but occasionally, or perhaps more than occasionally, she reveals a bit of a darker side. She's flushed Peggy's keys, thrown Peggy's glasses and shoes into a garbage disposal, and replaced Bobby's fruit pies with mud. She's also had more than her fair share of mental breakdowns. And let's not forget her parents are total unhinged and destructive degenerates, which may be where she picked up these traits. Come on, Luann, let's get out of this dump. In the Propane Boom episode, we see that Luann is studying for a test on propane. And one of the facts that is oddly emphasized is that propane is flammable, something we don't think too much of at the time. Luann demonstrates some of her destructive habits when breaking up with Buckley at the Megalo Mart. This is when Hank detects the propane leak. We don't see Luann or Buckley at this time, but both of them are still inside the Megalo Mart. The theory suggests that she was the one to set off the explosion that ultimately killed Buckley. And the reason why she's visited by his angel is because she has a guilty conscience. Although Luann's darker side is never this dark, one could argue her intention was to blow up the Megalomart, but not kill Buckley. I wish you never died. And Buckley's angel was there for her to reconcile with the fact that she also killed him as well. Bill is Bobby's father. Yes, we have to go over this theory. It is, after all, the most widespread King of the Hill theory on the internet. Now, the first clue we have is the fact that Bobby and Bill do look very similar. Granted, this may just be an animation style choice from Mike Judge, but the two have a lot of similarities in terms of appearance, certainly more so than Bobby and Hank. But let's continue down the rabbit hole. Bill has always had a really, really unhealthy obsession with Peggy. It's played for comedy, but a lot of the stuff he does is what you would expect from a stalker or serial killer. You wanna go for a walk? Go back to your house. Hank, on the other hand, has always struggled because of his narrow urethra. Him and Peggy were unable to conceive a child prior to Bobby, and Peggy getting pregnant with Bobby was considered something of a miracle due to Hank's condition. But then again, maybe it wasn't a miracle. Maybe Peggy had a little help from Bill. But Peggy hates Bill, you might say. Well, she currently hates Bill. Bill is something of a gross, self-loathing slob, but he wasn't always like that. In fact, Bill was once a pretty desirable guy. A high school football star known as the Billdozer, everybody loved him, he was in great shape, had a full head of hair, and oozed confidence. At some point, all of that went away. Likely abruptly. But perhaps this was after Bobby came along. And Peggy used him at the time for the sake of having a child. 
this kind of fits the whole tragedy of Bill narrative that is a constant throughout the series. Essentially hated by the woman who had his child, who would grow up to never know that he is the father. It's really a thematic bow on the top of Bill's depressing life. I'm so depressed I can't even blink. And if Peggy chose Bill originally because of his desirable genes, and then ultimately saw him turn into what he is now, it makes sense that she would resent him and ultimately dislike him. And finally, let's not forget that Bill intentionally passed the Dotree family recipe onto Bobby. Could this have been intentional? Knowing that he is in fact Bobby's biological dad? Possibly. There are several father-son bonding moments between Bill and Bobby. There's even a moment where Bill blurts out that he once slept with Peggy during a moment of weakness. Though Hank asserts he's obviously lying, and Bill immediately says he's lying. I slept with Peggy. No, you didn't, Bill. I know. Still, it is a bit on the nose, and maybe he got cold feet after his confession. The only real monkey wrench in this theory is that Bobby does look just like Cotton, Hank's dad. On top of that, in flashbacks, young Hank also looks significantly like Bobby as well. And for this reason, we rank this theory as probably not true, but there's still a significant possibility that it is. Hank and Hal are brothers. If you remember the character Hal, who Hank befriends after the two mistake each other's trucks for their own, you'll remember that the two men are very alike. In fact, they're pretty much exactly alike. Not just in appearance, but in their hobbies, mannerisms, and personality. You sure you never worked in propane? Is it possible that these two are long lost brothers? That's what this theory suggests. I mean, Hank's dad Cotton really got around. He's bragged about his conquest of women on a regular basis, his other son in Japan looks like the spitting image of Hank, and has all the same mannerisms, just like Hal. Could Hal be another half-brother of Hank and Jinichiro? This might be a trend with Cotton, we're ranking this one as definitely a possibility. John Redcorn is an agent of the King in Yellow. This is another really interesting theory that may be thematic more than anything, and it requires a little bit of backstory. The King of Yellow was a collection of short horror stories published in 1895. In them, Hester is the embodiment of the concept of corruption. This theory suggests that John Redcorn, the Native American healer of Arlen, is in fact the Hester, the agent of the King in Yellow, all due to his corruptive nature. Now, keep in mind, this theory's definition of corruption is a bit old school in terms of more biblical morality. John Redcorn turns Nancy against her husband through seduction. This happens all throughout the series. He corrupts the Gribble family by fathering a child with Nancy. No, I pass it along to you. From a religious standpoint, he corrupts Bobby, pushing him away from his Methodist upbringing and introducing him to Wimantanya, which results in Bobby nearly killing a whooping crane. Now nah, you done it. Now nah, you really gone and done it. He's also turned Bobby against his dad in one of the Thanksgiving episodes. He opens a casino on his property in order to attract an audience for his rock band. Both gambling and rock and roll are seen as corrupting forces from an old school point of view. Dale mentions that Nancy ran into John at the video store, the implication being they were renting adult videos. Nancy tells me she ran into John Redcorn at the video store. Patronizing Arlen's adult entertainment industry would be considered corrupting. He also plans to attend the adult film awards being held in Arlen, again privately subsidizing the pornography industry. In the episode Peggy's Headache, he treats Peggy for a migraine, which is code for infidelity when it comes to John Redcorn. He also violently reacts to Hank's dream about Nancy, which reinforces Hank's instinct to keep the secret from his wife. You having dirty dreams about my sweet Nan Nan? He convinces Dale, Bobby, and Joseph to starve themselves and deprive themselves of rest in order to hallucinate. As a children's music power agent, he corrupts Luann into selling out, diminishing her art and causing stress. And the craziest piece of evidence, look at the symbol here. This is very similar to the yellow sign. In the original story, this symbol is of unknown nature and possesses a strange siren call to the dark world, and those who are exposed to it are doomed. I think John Redcorn has some real skeletons in his closet. Dale knows Joseph isn't his son. Dale is the most extreme form of conspiracy theorist. 
one who doesn't trust anyone at all. He monitors phone calls and has all sorts of surveillance, so the irony of him being suspicious of everything other than his wife cheating right under his nose is a pretty brilliant piece of comedic writing. Now get inside and start massaging my wife. But what if Dale does know? I mean, Dale has even said that he has a tracking chip in his wife, yet still can't figure out that she's in a relationship with John Redcorn, and that his son looks just like the guy who his wife spends all of her time with. It just seems impossible. This theory suggests that Dale knows all about the affair and just lets it happen, mainly because he's so reliant on Nancy given how unable he is to take care of himself, which is pretty sad. I support us but I contribute. It's not really a secret that if Nancy wasn't around to reel him in, Dale would probably be a much larger threat to himself and others. And as we learned in a number of episodes, Nancy is the breadwinner of the family. So the leverage in the relationship is definitely hers. Not just because she makes the money, but because Dale doesn't really offer a whole lot in general, given the fact that he creates far more problems than he fixes. It's over. I'm leaving you! The reality could be that Dale just lets his wife cheat, and nobody talks about it openly because of how awkward it is. Now then, these following conspiracies make a lot of sense. In fact, we think they're more likely to be true than not. These theories are probable. Hank Hill has Asperger's Syndrome, Autism, or OCD. We know all of these are different, but there is a lot of crossover, and we do think that Hank probably has at least one of them. Simply put, Hank really likes and requires routine and gets incredibly uncomfortable when confronted with some sort of change, as well as anything different from his normal life. When it comes to social norms, Hank gets incredibly uncomfortable with sex and intimacy. He's also incredibly oblivious in a number of social situations, like thinking two gay men are brothers. All right, they're gay, ha ha ha. When it comes to his hobbies, he's very obsessive about all of them. His life revolves around propane, and he assumes that his love for his hobbies, like carpentry, his lawn, and football, are the default for everyone. Everything from his tools to the way he runs Strickland is organized and in place. Now that's where I want the tank when it comes back. And anytime something goes out of whack, he needs to immediately fix it and get it back to normal, or else he gets tremendously anxious. At one point, Hank quickly develops a video game addiction, and this really showcases his obsessive behavior. It seems very likely that Hank is either somewhere on the autism spectrum or someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder. And for that matter, Dale is on the autism spectrum. Many people have heard the Hank Hill autism theory, but what about Dale? There's a lot of evidence to suggest that Dale too is on the spectrum. Dale has very poor social skills. This is obvious throughout the entire series. Many of his schemes lack any sort of social awareness. We will breed servant roaches. And like Hank, Dale also has many obsessions. But in the case of Dale, his obsessions are just unhealthy. He has an obsession with conspiracies, insects, and guns. Not that guns are bad in general, but certainly a concern with someone with Dale's immaturity and aggression. Dale also has the tendency to talk to himself, which is a common trait of someone who is on the spectrum. And like Hank, Dale is also about routine. Heck, in one episode, it's revealed he has to eat nine meals a day. I like nine small meals throughout the day. And let's not forget about Dale's inability to pick up social cues around sex and intimacy is arguably worse than Hank's. He isn't able to see that his wife is cheating, unless of course you buy the theory that he does, and he even says that he thinks John Redcorn is gay in one episode. John Redcorn's gay and I've been friends with him for years. Peggy's fanfare is a fantasy. This is a theory that expands upon Peggy's narcissism, which we will touch on again later. In the episode Peggy's Fanfare, while in Nashville, Peggy hears a song performed by Randy Travis that she wrote. The plot revolves around her song being stolen. No, 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 you don't understand. I am not the bad guy. Hank, will you say something? 
At the beginning of the episode, Peggy receives a standard rejection letter from Randy Travis's lawyer regarding a song she sent in. In typical Peggy fashion, she interprets this as praise and encouragement for a genuine songwriting career. He said I have a career in front of me. This theory suggests that everything that happens in the episode afterwards is in her own head that she is essentially dreaming up this situation in which she attends a music festival and learns that her song was stolen. Ultimately, she reveals the truth and finally gets the opportunity to hit Hank with a nice big ol' I told you so. Now, this may seem a little outlandish, but this really, really fits in with Peggy's narcissism. In fact, this is a really common behavior of narcissistic people with dark triad personality traits. Please punish Randy Travis for stealing my song. Essentially dreaming up situations in which they are wronged and ultimately reveal themselves as the righteous ones at the end of their dreams. A lot of psychologists believe this is because the high of the positive outcome is amplified by the low of the perceived wrongdoing against them, which is why narcissists typically do this. You also have the portion of the plot that involves Peggy almost killing Randy Travis accidentally. And getting away with it. This is another trait of narcissism and borderline personality disorder, essentially justifying something horrible happening to someone because they're the quote bad guy. Ultimately, according to this theory, Peggy would return home with the validation of being an amazing songwriter without any need to pursue it because she's already proven it to those around her. We're not going to call this theory a truth bomb because it is quite speculative, but damn, it is so in tune with her character personality that we think it's very likely to be true. And finally, we've reached the truth. People have blown the whistle on these theories with such compelling evidence that it must be true, or it's been confirmed. These theories are the truth bombs. A brain injury made Peggy a narcissist. There's no hiding the fact that Peggy Hill is a narcissist. It's a common character trait she has and is honestly what makes her character so funny and also hateable. She takes far too much pride in even the most mundane accomplishments and does everything she can to reroute conversations back to herself. But one fan theory points to an exact moment where her narcissism really got kicked into high drive. In the season three finale, as old as the hills, Peggy goes skydiving. Unfortunately for her, both of her parachutes fail and she slams into a field of mud. Uncle Hank, we're too late! Not only did Peggy break all sorts of bones, it seems like she also developed a brain injury, which increased her narcissism tremendously. Every episode that takes place after this event showcases Peggy's narcissism in a much more extreme way. For example, when Peggy eventually takes over the Sugarfoot's restaurant, she plasters her face and name over everything. No normal person would do this. She even adds her name to the sign outside. We see Peggy's narcissism taken to a comical extreme in an almost episodely basis right after she nearly died in that skydiving accident. I'm better off in the living room anyway. I can run the whole house from here. And finally, Luann would have been a successful mechanic. To round things out, we're gonna end with a bit of a positive one. It's simple, yet the evidence is pretty undeniable. Luann is not the brightest bulb in the box. <laughs> In fact, she comes off as straight up useless in a lot of situations. She certainly didn't have what it takes to be a cosmetologist, but there was another profession she probably should have pursued, auto mechanic. In the very first episode, we see that Luann is able to drain Hank's fuel line and get his truck running with ease. It wouldn't start at first because you had a clogged fuel line, but I blew it clean. And that's saying quite a bit because Hank and his friends couldn't even figure it out themselves. And in the episode Shins of the Father, Cotton tries to sabotage a vehicle, and once again, Luann is able to fix the problem without much effort. Basically, what we're saying is that Luann could have made a great auto mechanic if she had pursued it. Whew, and that's everything. What do you think? Which of these theories seems most likely to be true? Let us know, and make sure to check out some of our other King of the Hill videos. We've ranked all the residents of Arlen on the morality spectrum in our Good to Evil series, and we've even talked about the worst things that Peggy Hill has done. Also, let us know what other cartoons you want us to feature on our theory series, BS to Truth Bombs. But most importantly, stay wicked.